Kitty Lee Du, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Better Salaries for with Better Data workshop. Uh, this is an enticing introduction to the ARL Annual Salary Survey. And uh, um, we want to make it enticing because it's always hard to look through uh, publications that have a lot of tables with numbers. Uh, so we hope with today's webcast we'll give you uh, a good perspective of how to approach uh, this kind of information uh, for better decision making. The webcast that we're doing today is the first of four webcasts planned this year featuring work related to the data we collect through the ARL Annual Salary Survey. And uh, before we go too far, let me say thank you to all of you who are joining us here today and mention again the logistics uh, of uh, this session. Everyone will be muted to cut down on background noise. We do welcome questions, and we want you to type your questions, and we stand ready to answer all of them. Questions and answers that we do not answer, as well as the ones we answer during the webcast, they'll be available uh, to the attendees after the webcast. Um, so it is uh, my privilege to work with the um, ARL libraries for a number of years now and with the people who submit the salary survey data to us. And I'm also very happy to have here with me today my, as my co-presenter, my colleague, Shanika Morris, who has been working with these data um, for a couple of years now. Uh, so we want to... Um, cover the following goals in today's webcast. We want to give you an overview of the salary survey, but we also want to give you snapshots and look at some of the trends in the data. And uh, we will also discuss recent changes to the survey and set the stage for the other webcasts, the other three webcasts that are scheduled uh, later in the year. And we plan to do that by looking a little bit at the history of the survey um, and brief overview of the data collection methods. And we'll give you a snapshot of some of the results from 2011-12 and talk uh, what we did with the 2012-2013 um, uh, salary survey. And a sneak peek, as Shanika put it there, for the um, data that uh, uh, we have in our hands this year. The publication is not out yet, but we'll uh, share with you some information and hope to take uh, Q&A from, uh, from you. So it, we do want to also have a little bit of interaction with you. So we have a couple of polls, and uh, this uh, poll specifically asks you, um, the following um, question, whether you have seen, browsed through, or read the ARL salary survey publication. And uh, the poll should be in front of your computer, uh, so you should be able to answer uh, the uh, question. And um, let me uh, show the results. Uh, a number of you have um, said yes. Uh, the majority of the people who are uh, watching the webcast have seen the um, the publication, which is uh, really great. It's, um, so hopefully what we'll cover will help you understand um, understand the information even deeper. So just as um, uh, part of the history, the salary survey is uh, done through the ARL Statistics and Assessment Program that serves an important goal, uh, an important strategic uh, goal to describe and measure the performance of research libraries and their contribution to research, teaching, scholarship, and community service. And we have done that over the years with two flagship publications, the ARL statistics publication that collects institutional data and the uh, salary survey that collects uh, the salary information we'll talk more about. The two publications you, uh, you are seeing here um, 
we have covered the, the first one uh, on the left uh, through a webcast we did on June uh, 5th, uh, 2012. And that webcast is available on YouTube uh, if you want to find out more about that publication. Today we will talk about the publication on the right side, uh, the salary survey. And the, the salary survey goes back to uh, 1972-73. Uh, I do have one more poll question for you. Um, let me um, push the poll to, to you. Here we ask you to uh, define whether your role in relation to the salary survey is that of a survey coordinator whether you are assisting a survey coordinator with the data submission, or a third choice is just uh, whether you are just an interested um, reader, uh, an interested uh, librarian. Um, and I'm going to take a look at the results. Um, and we have the majority. Oops, I, I pushed the wrong results there. Uh, this is the results of the second poll. And uh, we see we have 30% being survey coordinators. 13% uh, of the people attending the webcast are helping survey coordinators uh, with the data submission. Uh, but the majority, 56% of the audience, uh, is just um, interested uh, in the salary survey information. Uh, thank you for answering our polls. Now, to um, give you a sense of uh, how we we go about collecting some of these data, we do have a, a web portal, a website, uh, the Aerial Statistics website. Uh, and there is a difference. There's a big distinction between the Aerial Statistics as a PDF publication or as a print publication and the Aerial Statistics website. Um, because the Aerial Statistics website is home to a number of different surveys, and it is the home of the ARL salary survey as well, uh, because this is the uh, website through which we collect the data. To give you a sense of what else uh, that website includes, it, it includes a, number, a series of annual publications and uh, surveys that describe collections, expenditures, staffing, and service activities. And among those is um, the Academic Health Sciences Library Statistics, the Academic Law Library Statistics. We uh, even uh, pull data together and we create series um, of data without actually surveying libraries. For example, the University and Library Total Expenditure series is something we uh, track from existing information on library expenditures from our ARL statistics survey and pulling into our interface data from uh, the NCS, the National Center for Education Statistics, uh, where they collect data on university characteristics and budgets. And uh, in this case, we take from uh, NCS and, uh, in particular, the IPEDS data collection within NCS. Uh, IPEDS stands for Integrated Post-Secondary Education Data Service. It is a series of um, surveys uh, the Department of Education uh, has to collect data on uh, institutions of higher education. And one of these surveys um, has information on university uh, expenditures. And we pull that information from uh, NCS iPads into our um, interface and into uh, the resources we make available uh, to our member libraries. Now, the ARL Annual Salary Survey is one of the surveys, as we said, housed in this interface. A couple of other surveys, the Source of Funds is a survey that uh, Carlos Stoffel from the University of Arizona established, and um, it had a lot of interest. Uh, it's not done annually. It's periodic. It's being uh, up collected every couple of years. We ask uh, people to tell us uh, whether they are um, uh, they are um, 
funds are coming from student fees uh, or from other sources, uh, indirect costs, or what other allocation um, sources um, their funds are coming from. We did used to have a test bed for um, testing new um, questions, the ARL supplementary statistics. We don't have that this year. Um, there have been other years before when we did not have supplementary statistics. Um, and uh, uh, we also house there an older data collection series uh, called the ARL Preservation Statistics that was discontinued a few years ago. So we have some historical uh, series there. Uh, the website includes also a directory of survey contacts and um, people who um, are familiar with these resources in our member libraries. Um, so we can um, sort of create a community and be in touch with one another. Uh, a little bit about the, the history of the two flagship um, publications. Uh, the ARL statistics goes back to 1908 with the Gerald statistics. And the salary survey does not go back that far. Uh, one wonders how much the average salary was in 1908. The salary survey goes back to 1967. And that was the year uh, when the Association of Research Libraries conducted the first of what has become the ARL Annual Salary Survey. And it has been published annually since 1972-73. And I can tell you in 1972-73, the um, average, uh, the median salary uh, was uh, in the range of, you know, in the West 13,000, North Central 12,000, Northeast 13,000, in the South, South area it was 11,700, and the beginning salaries were less than 10,000 at that time. So it's interesting to look at some of these historical uh, perspectives. We all feel rich this way. Uh, the um, uh, current annual salary survey, the latest uh, iteration of it, the 2012-2013, reports salaries for more than 13,000 professional positions in ARL member libraries. And these data are used to determine whether salaries are competitive, whether they are equitable across institutions and personal characteristics, and whether they are keeping up with inflation. And the survey also tracks minority representation in ARL U.S. libraries. Uh, not the Canadian ones, because they uh, conceive um, uh, diversity in slightly different ways. Uh, the survey also reports separate data for Canadian ARL libraries and separate data for ARL health sciences libraries and ARL law libraries. And also there is a section for ARL non-university libraries in that um, survey. So when it comes to the data collection, the salary survey is basically collected in two parts. There is part one that covers institutional information, and it's slightly different for university libraries and non-university libraries. For university libraries, uh, that institutional information covers beginning professional salary. What would you pay uh, a, newly a newly hired professional? This is not the salary of any one specific person. It's the advertised beginning professional salary. And um, in that part, part one, we also, for university libraries, we also collect information on the rank structure uh, that the library has. Some libraries have a three-level rank structure. Some have four levels. Some have five levels. These are the most popular um, types of levels libraries have, ARL libraries have. There are libraries, though, uh, that have uh, fewer than three levels and uh, more than five. Uh, the institutional information in terms of the non-university libraries also uh, captures beginning professional salary and captures median uh, salary information. Now, in part two, where we collect the data for um, individuals, but in an anonymous way, of course. We capture there for the university libraries the demographic and salary data for each employee. We use a standardized list of job codes 
And this year, for the first time, we did um, uh, collect working job titles to ground and uh, see how the working job titles uh, map the new uh, categories we developed. Uh, and on the non-university library side, the individual data uh, comes, uh, ca get captured in a summary uh, way um, by capturing the distribution of employees across different salary ranges. Now, we do uh, collect data only on professional positions with the current salary survey. And since the criteria for determining professional status vary among libraries, there is no attempt to define the term professional. This uh, often comes as you know a request from the field. We receive calls, how do you define a professional? We let every library decide uh, how that would work for their environment. So each library reports salaries of those staff members it considers professionals, irrespective of faculty status or membership in a collective bargaining unit. And it includes, when appropriate, staff that are not librarians in the strict sense of the word, uh, professionals like computer experts and systems analysts and budget officers can be included in the salary survey. Now, the data, as um, I alluded, is uh, collected in an anonymous way, and the um, salary survey data are highly co confidential. And uh, the raw data, of course, are not made available. Only summary data and aggregated data are made available. Uh, to protect confidentiality, uh, we do not publish any statistic that includes um, fewer than four observations, four, fewer than four people reporting on a, on a specific uh, characteristic. Uh, so how do we use the salary survey effectively? Shanika is available to tell us a little bit more about that part. Shanika. All right. Thank you so much, Martha, for that great introduction and discussion of the history and data collection methods for the ARL Salary Survey. My name is Shanika Morris, and I'm the Statistics Editorial Assistant for the Association of Research Libraries, and I serve as one of the points of contact on the statistics and assessment team here at ARL. The ARL Salary Survey um, collects a treasure trove of data that can be used for benchmarking and for promoting higher salaries for library professionals. Um, and before we get started, Looking at um, some of the data, um, I want to direct your attention to the following slide, which provides two example personas that I'd like you to keep in mind during this portion of the presentation. Um, I'd like to note that these examples were created for illustration purposes only, and that any resemblance to real or fictitious individuals is purely coincidental. So first, I'd like to introduce you to Lisa Librarian. She is our female non-minority prototypical librarian with 15 years of professional experience. She's the head of circulation in her library, and her rank is Librarian 3. Um, and her fictitious library has a four-level ranking system. Um, her uh, salary is $80,500 a year in U.S. dollars, and she works in a library in Canada. Our second prototype is Larry Librarian. He is a male minority librarian with five years of professional experience, and um, his fictitious job is as a cataloger and metadata librarian with a salary of $51,000 a year, and Larry works at a library in North Central U.S. We'll revisit Lisa and Larry at the end of the presentation. So in this portion of the webcast, we'll focus on the 2011-12 data, highlighting salary comparisons from a number of different perspectives. We will examine the following questions. Who works in ARL libraries? What do they do? Where do they work, and how much do they earn? So let's dive into the data. This map shows the dispersion of ARL libraries in the United States and Canada, and the personnel snapshot for the 2011-12 salary survey is shown on this slide. 
the 2011-12 salary survey reported data for 13,956 professional staff members in ARL university and non-university libraries, and of these, 1,672 professional staff members worked in the 72 medical and 72 law libraries. In the demographics snapshot, we see that the average overall salary in university libraries was $74,429 per year, and the average years of experience was 17.4. Law and medical libraries were not included in the calculation of these two statistics. The 2011-12 data show that salaries for women in ARL university libraries have not yet met parity with that of men. In 2011-12, the overall salary for women was 96.22% of that of men for the 115 ARL university libraries. The gender pay gap exists among minority librarians as well. In 2011-12, the overall salary for female minorities in ARL libraries was 93.34% of that of male minorities in ARL libraries. The average salary of the 112 ARL University Library Directors was $208,787 in 2011-12, and the average years of experience for ARL University Library Directors was 33.3. Again, the salaries of law and medical library directors were not included in the calculation of these statistics. The next slide shows compensation data for the entire data set, including law and medical libraries. And on this slide, we see that the average salary for all ARL university libraries, including law and medical libraries, was $74,737 per year. And the median salary in 2011-12 was $68,407 per year. Canadian ARL libraries had the highest average salary of $89,778 per year in U.S. dollars, and our non-university libraries had the highest median salary at $95,046 per year. The next slide shows salary distribution by rank and rank level, and on this side we see that the majority of professionals work in libraries with a four-step rank structure, and the highest average salary and the greatest figure for years of experience belong to librarians at level five in libraries with a five-level rank structure. On the next slide, we see the gender distribution in ARL university libraries in 2011-12. In keeping with previous years, the gender, gender distribution was close to a 60-40 split with women comprising 63.6% of library professionals in 2011-12. Likewise, the percentages of minority professional staff members in U.S. ARL university libraries is comparable to past year's data. In 2011-12, 14.2% of the professional staff in U.S. ARL university libraries, including law and medical libraries, belong to one of the four non-Caucasian categories for which ARL keeps records. Note that the data for minority professionals comes only from the U.S. ARL university libraries following the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission definitions. Canadian law prohibits the identification of Canadians by ethnic category. Now that we've looked at who works in ARL libraries, let's examine what these libraries, librarians do. The following slides show position data for professionals in ARL libraries. The first slide in this section shows university librarians grouped by position, position with functional specialists being the largest group we see that women make up the largest proportion of the other professionals group. And the other professionals group includes the following positions, public services, technical services, and professionals in non-supervisory positions in administrative and other units. Next slide shows the distribution of ARL, st 
library staff across 10 geographic regions. You'll notice that the region with the largest concentration of ARL libraries, which is the South Atlantic region, doesn't have the largest number of professionals in each of the position categories. Now, when we list beginning professional salaries in ascending order, Boston University and Princeton University comprise the ends of the beginning professional salary range, and Georgia Tech, Ohio State, and UT Austin are all at the median with beginning professional salaries of $46,000. For the students who are joining us for this webcast today, I encourage you to use the ARL Salary Survey as you prepare to go in the job market as the Salary Survey publication lists beginning professional salaries for all ARL university libraries. This includes public and private ARL university libraries making the Salary Survey publication a great resource for you. The next section of this snapshot addresses our fourth question, how much do they earn, by showcasing salary data for ARL university librarians from a number of different perspectives. As mentioned previously, the gender pay gap in ARL libraries is steadily shrinking. The next two slides show average salary by position and gender in the yellow highlighted cells show the 14 categories where females earn more than their male counterparts. On the next slide, we see the two categories in which women, on average, have less experience than men but have higher salaries. And those two categories are head serials and head documents and maps. The red cells indicate the categories for which women on average have more experience than men but lower salaries. And those four categories are associate director, assistant director, functional specialist, and department head other. The next two slides show salary data by gender for minority U.S. ARL university librarians. Now, Slides 39 and 41 of this presentation contain similar data to these two slides. However, slides 39 and 41 include data from Canadian ARL libraries, so please keep this in mind when comparing the data on these two slides for minority U.S. ARL librarians with the data on slides 39 and 41. We now move on to data that answers the question, where do ARL librarians work? ARL classifies member libraries into the following 10 regions. For the full breakdown of average salaries by position for each geographic region, please see Table 25 in the 2011-12 ARL Salary Survey publication. On this slide, we see that the highest average salaries were found in Canada, followed by New England, with salaries in the Pacific region coming in third. The West South Central region had the lowest average salary. And Shanika, it's worth mentioning um, uh, that uh, the currency exchange rate mm -hmm. affects uh, dramatically uh, the position of Canadians and U.S. Um, figures. Uh, right now, um, they are on a the currency exchange uh, is pretty much on a par, one for one, more or less. Uh, but um, uh, 10 years ago, uh, it was 1.5 to 1. Uh, so uh, the Canadian uh, uh, salaries were at the other end of the scale 10 years ago. So it's, it's interesting to see, um, you know, the... Canadians being on the high end of the scale in the recent years. Much, Martha. The following two slides group ARL University libraries into three institutional types, public, private, and Canadian. And in keeping um, with what Martha just mentioned about um, how the exchange rate has changed over time, the yellow highlighting shows that the highest average salary for each specified position um, is held by the Canadian region, with the exception of two position categories. 
library director, and assistant director. So this concludes the snapshot of the 2011-12 ARL salary survey data, and I'll turn it back over to Martha to share about the revisions to the 2012-13 ARL salary survey. I noticed that we have one question. Um, do we want to take that question now or um, wait until the end, Martha? Yeah, we can take it now. Uh, okay. Why do you use average versus median? It's Brian Case from Florida asking us that question. Shanika, do you want to say something? Um, well, um, actually the salary survey presents both averages and medians. Um, in the, the bulk of the body tables, we do um, present the average salary, um, but in the I think it's the first four tables of the salary survey, we um, present median salary data, um, and, and not to this level of granularity, looking at all the different positions by medians. Um, and I, I think um, what Brian is getting at um, is that the median salary actually represents the 50th percentile um, for any given statistic. Um, and it's also um, a, a statistic that um, can give you more descriptive data about, you know, any um, collection of data. Martha, your thoughts? Yeah, I think both the average and the median um, figures are useful to look at and take into account. They both describe uh, in general terms uh, uh, your distribution, you know, how, uh, what, if there is a one number that you can use to describe your distribution, uh, you know, this could be the average, this could be the median. There are certain um, pros and cons for using medians uh, and for using averages. Um, as, as you, uh, Shanika, uh, you mentioned, the median is the 50th percentile, so it is uh, uh, less likely to be affected by outlying uh, figures, by outliers. Uh, so if you have outliers that, um, um, you know, are on the one end or on the other end, very high salaries, very low salaries, um, it, it might be better to look at the median instead of the average. Uh, on the other hand, the average is um, uh, calculated in a way that takes into account all the information in all of your data. Uh, so in that sense, you know, you're not uh, excluding or um, disregarding um, any, any type of uh, information in the data when you use the average, uh, both, both average and median figures are good to take a look at. Um, this was um, uh, very good. Thank you, Keith. Uh, one more question I see there. Is there any interest to explore median salaries compared to the cost of living on each region? Actually, we do um, have um, CPI data, the Consumer Price Index, included in the publication. Um, I, I, I think it's um, tables one through four include the CPI data. Currently, we don't have um, a comparison of the median salary data with um, any cost of living indicators by region. Um, or yeah, not, Martha. Yeah, it's not in the publication. There is actually a, a resource we have made available on the web that was developed by a colleague uh, in. Uh, uh, an area library a number of years ago where she had adjusted the average and the median uh, institutional salaries by cost of living, and we did put that on the web. Um, again, this is a, a good information that we would be happy to update. If any of you updates it and wants to share it with us, we'll put it on the website. Um, uh, it would be something useful to do, so thank you for pointing that out. Um, let me see, do we have others? Okay, I think we can move on um, with uh, a, a section now on the 2012-13 ARL salary survey, and uh, in particular about the revision process 
uh, that we uh, implemented. Uh, beginning in 2011, the salary survey categories for the university libraries were revised and uh, modernized uh, through an extensive review process that was led by a specially appointed task force. Uh, the ARL board appointed the task force on reviewing the ARL statistics, the ARL annual salary survey, and the ARL supplementary statistics. And uh, the proposed changes were uh, reviewed by the ARL directors who were all interviewed before the revisions were uh, implemented. Uh, there was also a vetting process through the ARL board and extensive feedback received uh, by the survey coordinators. Um, now the recommendations were forwarded to uh, the ARL board in October 2011 and the revised survey forms were approved and were uh, in the field collecting data uh, this past summer in uh, uh, May 2012. Uh, we posted the new surveys and we were collecting uh, the data. The revised 2012-13 ARL salary survey um, was uh, um, given um, with a certain guiding, uh, the, re the revising process was done with a certain guiding uh, principles uh, behind it. Uh, the the main principle was to focus on what's important, to modernize where needed, and to streamline as needed. And the goal uh, was to enhance the utility of these annual surveys uh, for the 21st century research library environment. Uh, these are, are historical annual uh, data collection efforts that have a lot of legacy and uh, a lot of history behind them. So this was a, re a major revision process um, and uh, with a clear um, focus on increasing the utility of these um, surveys. So the main um, aspect of the revision on the salary survey focused on the job categories and the job codes we used uh, as a number of um, of categories um, were overbloated over the years. Everybody was putting people under the functional specialist category because they didn't quite fit in any other group. Um, and there were fewer and fewer, you know, traditional catalogers and some of the other um, uh, categories. So we um, did develop a new uh, category and job code schema that introduced, uh, in addition to the functional specialists, two other specialist uh, groups. The administrative specialist that provides critical organizational support that uh, is institutional in, in nature, and this can include people in the finance uh, department or the personnel department. This is um, one of the new specialist categories. And the second specialist category is the digital specialist category, uh, defined as providing technical support and expertise needed uh, to um, maintain services that are digital in nature. Now, these um, new specialist categories uh, include some um, new uh, subcategories. For example, under administrative specialist, uh, we have a, a dev category uh, specifically for development and advancement um, uh, specialists. And similarly, under the digital specialist category, we have um, a more uh, specified uh, functions um, coded as scholar, for example, for anyone with a scholarly communications responsibility. And the definition um, includes uh, the notion that this person works and promotes open access, provides advice on copyright issues and fair use. Um, IR is another digital uh, specialist subcategory, IR standing for Institutional Repository Curator. Uh, DGACQ, 
the uh, digital acquisitions uh, person. Uh, this person acquires e-resources and manages licensing and electronic resources. And we have also a DigiCure, uh, a person who creates and curates digital collections in sciences, social sciences, and humanities, including data management issues across uh, multiple disciplines. And uh, um, the um, few more here that we have the uh, assess uh, group uh, code uh, job code for assessment management information systems and uh, planning uh, positions and we also have a CTL uh, code for coordinator team leader non supervisory um, responsibility uh, category. Now, a couple of these, this last one especially, didn't receive a lot of, uh, of code, so we are looking into uh, probably a minor adjustment as, uh, for next year. Um, the uh, one category that uh, uh, has a lot of people uh, this year is the subject specialist, and we've had uh, a couple of different um, uh, discussions and feedback from the survey coordinators as to whether we need to uh, refine subject specialists into possibly the humanities, the social sciences, or the sciences. Uh, and another uh, subject specialist category that uh, some aerial directors expressed interest in uh, uh, in seeing uh, uh, possibly as standing on its own is uh, the uh, subject specialty in relation to different language expertise, the language specialists. So, uh, you know, some of what we see in the data will definitely inform um, um, any adjustments we may need to do in the survey form this summer. And Martha, uh, yes. I wanted to mention that the last two subcodes on that slide are actually new subcodes under functional specialists. Yeah, um, let me put that slide, slide back there. Um, the assess and the CTL. Yes, right. The assess and the CTL. Um, they're indented because they're subcodes, um, but they they are subcodes for the functional specialist category, not the digital specialist category. So I just wanted to clarify that. And and we did manage to to get uh, the functional specialist uh, as not being the most populous category this year, right, Shanika? Uh, it's the subject specialist that uh, is the most populous this year. So it's, um, I think uh, the refinement has, has given us a bit more granularity, which will be assessed, by the way, and evaluated in relation to the working job titles that we have. So this is another uh, piece of information we will be using to see what adjustments we need to make. Um, And we did have uh, not only a new job category schema, but we did have a new submission method this year. We are um, now uh, collecting the salary survey through the ARLstatistics.org website. Uh, it was implemented for the first time this past summer, and uh, our uh, hope and goal is to integrate uh, the two flagship data collection efforts, the aerial statistics and the salary survey, under this portal. Uh, we also think that uh, this portal will give us some ability to do uh, some salary survey uh, data analytics like we do with the aerial statistics, you know, not as granular as the aerial statistics due to, again, confidentiality purposes, but uh, uh, at you know, definitely at some aggregation level. So now that we have the 2012-13 data in our hands, Shanika will tell us what the trends look like. All right. So um, let's take a sneak peek at the 2012-13 uh, salary survey. All right. As we can see on our personnel snapshot, the 2012-13 Salary Survey reported data for 13,895 professional staff members in ARL University and non-university libraries 
and of these, 1,661 professional staff members worked in the 72 medical and 77 law libraries. Um, and on the next slide, we see that the average overall salary in ARL University libraries rose to $75,660 in 2012-13, while the average years of experience was 17.3 years, a slight decrease compared to the 2011-12 data. Law and medical library salaries were not included in the calculation of these two statistics. This snapshot shows that salaries for women in ARL libraries have not yet met parity with that of men in keeping with past year's data. In 2012-13, the overall salary for women was 95.85% that of men for the 115 ARL university libraries, showing a slight increase in the pay gap which was 96.22% in 2011-12. We see the same pattern in the gender pay gap among minority librarians. In 2012-13, the overall salary for minority women was 91.54% of that of minority men in the 115 ARL university libraries, excluding Canadian libraries. Um, because the minority uh, data are only collected for the U.S. Um, ARL university libraries. And the pay gap for minorities, by comparison, was 93.34% in 2011-12. The average salary of the 112 ARL library directors rose to sorry, rose to $217,820 with an average of 34.1 years of experience for the 112 ARL library directors. Both of these statistics increased this year, and the salaries of law and medical library directors were not included in the calculation of these two statistics. The next slide shows the compensation uh, data snapshot for the entire data set, including law and medical libraries. And we see that the average and median salaries for the entire data set rose to $75,937 and $69,259, respectively. The average salary for Canadian ARL libraries rose to $90,933 per year, and the median salary for non-universities rose to $95,158, reflecting the highest overall median salary. The next slide shows salary distribution by rank and rank level. In keeping with the 2011-12 data, the majority of professionals work in libraries with four-step rank structures, and the highest average salary and the highest figure for years of experience belong to librarians at level five in libraries with five-level rank structures. Statistics regarding the gender distribution for 2012-13 and the percentages of minority professional staff members in U.S. ARL libraries will be included in the upcoming 2012-13 ARL Salary Survey publication. So stay tuned. Now, remember Lisa and Larry, our prototypical librarians for this webcast? Let's look at their profiles in light of the data we've just examined. Just want to reiterate one more time that Lisa and Larry are fictional examples created for illustration purposes only, and that any resemblance to real or fictitious individuals is purely coincidental. So, in examining Lisa's profile, our question becomes how can the ARL salary data be used to benchmark Lisa's salary? which, as shown on this slide, is $80,500 a year in U.S. dollars. So when we look at the data, we see that Lisa's salary is a bit less than the average salary for her geographic region, but she earns more than the average salary for female heads of circulation and the 
She earns more than the average salaries for professionals at her rank level in libraries with comparable ranking systems. Her years of experience at 15 years of experience is less than the average is listed on this slide. It would seem that Lisa's salary may be on par with the salaries of librarians in her region, but we need to take a more nuanced look at the data to be sure. Please join us for the second and third webcasts in this series to be held on May 21st and September 10th, respectively. These webcasts will showcase how the salary survey data can be used locally to make a case for better salaries and how to develop equitable salary structures using the salary survey data. You don't want to miss these webcasts. Now let's turn our attention to Larry. So, Looking at Larry's profile, we ask, what can the ARL salary survey data reveal about salary trends for ethnic minorities and librarianship? And so um, on this slide, um, we've put together a comparison of the snapshot slides from the presentation for men only, and we also have um, data from 2011-12. Um, for years of experience. And we can immediately discern that every statistic on this slide for the first table um, has increased in comparison to the 2011-12 data, with the exception of the years of experience statistics. Larry's salary is less than the average salary for his geographic region, but he earns approximately but he earns more than the average salary for male minority catalogers with five to nine years of experience. Larry's years of professional experience at five years is less than the averages listed on this slide. It would seem that there could be a trend of increasing salaries and representation for minorities in ARL libraries. However, we would need to look at a longer trend line to be sure. Please join us for the final webcast in this series to be held on November 5th, which will examine changes in age and race ethnicity gem demographics over time in the ARL salary survey. You don't want to miss this webcast. I'll turn the presentation back over to Martha for her concluding thoughts. It's, uh, I'm actually going to jump to this slide that shows the three uh, additional webcasts um, Shanika mentioned to you. The May 21st one features three directors of ARL libraries, um, Carla Stoffel from the University of Arizona, Arnold Hirschen from Case Western University, and Jeffrey Terziak from uh, Washington University, St. Louis, um, uh, talking about uh, how they have used and they are using the salary information to um, uh, get from us uh, what we call a peer, uh, a peer customer report, a peer group customer report, and um, using that um, into their institutions. The September 10th webcast um, it will feature Brian Keith, who has used and, and developed uh, uh, a methodology to establish and maintain an equitable salary structure uh, for faculty librarians at the University of Florida. And uh, our colleague, Judy Rutenberg, uh, will also join him to uh, talk about ARL's agenda uh, regarding um, uh, human uh, resources and uh, human resources issues um, in, in a transformative environment. Uh, the, and the November 5th webcast uh, that Shanika just mentioned on uh, age and race ethnicity will feature uh, Stanley Wilder and uh, Mark Puente. Uh, uh, Mark Puente is our colleague here at ARL. Stanley Wilder uh, is a director at uh, uh, the university um, in, in uh, no, it's not on, in one of the Carolinas. I don't want to make a mistake. Okay, so we hope to see um, many of you there. There are questions I see that are coming in. Uh, let me make go there and see what we have. Okay, we have a thank you and uh, 
when will the, tw the 12, 13 full report be available? Okay, let's close on that note. Shanika, when do we estimate that to be available? Um, well, we, well, given the changes to the job codes um, and the, the revision, the tables, as you can imagine, will look quite different um, this year. There will be more categories and um, a more granular um, presentation um, of the uh, data in the functional specialist and in the new digital specialist and administrative specialist categories. So um, I don't have a, a concrete tentative date. I know that that's a paradox um, at this point, um, but we, we do expect it to be ready soon. The, well, we will be out before the um, the new survey goes of, uh, out, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've also made tables available uh, to uh, ARL libraries, and we will be making more tables available to ARL libraries as we look um, at uh, the distribution of the data in the new job categories and synthesizing them in new um, and different ways. Um, so I do estimate, you know, even with all the sample um, uh, tables that we are sending out, uh, that by May we will have the final set of tables um, out on the web. Oops, and I see one more question there. Um, let's see what that is about. Will there be a URL to watch the webinar for those? Yes, the webinar will be available on YouTube, and uh, we will send uh, the URL out so anybody can watch it. And uh, thank you very much to all of you for joining us today. Uh, please, if you are a survey coordinator, give us your data and uh, work with us, and uh, we'll turn it back into nice tables that will be useful to, to you and to the rest of our community. Thank you. Bye.